And thank you for adding me on to the schedule. It's a lonely topic on epilepsy here. Hopefully when that graph goes to the ceiling, then half of those will be about epilepsy. But in the meantime, it's exciting to uh, talk today about a study that was just IRB approved and just opened uh, as I think the first study in focused ultrasound for epilepsy that we're calling the FUSE study, focused ultrasound for a subcortical epilepsy. <clears throat> and that requires a little bit of explanation. These are just my disclosures. This is funded by the Epilepsy Foundation, the Focused Ultrasound Foundation, sponsored by Insight Tech, and I have research grants from a number of those other uh, organizations. So epilepsy, of course, requires a little bit of explanation because I'm talking about subcortical epilepsy, which is sort of a, a term we coined for this purpose in a way. Seizures are generally hyperexcitability of a group of neurons, uh, or seizures are, and epilepsy is the underlying tendency to seizures. And focal epilepsy is when seizures arise in just one spot or one focus as a uh, general principle. And of course, since they arise from neurons, from cell bodies, they're typically in the cortex. When we think about epilepsy, we think about seizures arising in the cortex. However, subcortical epilepsy is when the epileptic focus is not in the cortex, but someplace deeper, usually from arrested migration of neurons or development of neurons in abnormal locations, as I'll talk about. Uh, traditional surgery requires traversing the whole brain to get to those areas to uh, treat them when they're in those abnormal locations. And the pathology that's there is relatively characteristic. There aren't very many things that cause epilepsy from an arrest of neurons in the middle of the brain. And the five things located here are most common. So the uh, prototype would be hypothalamic hamartomas, so hamartomas in the hypothalamus, but also DNET, uh, dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumors, something that typically aren't exactly right in the middle of the brain, but, but could be. Same for focal nodular dysplasia. Usually we think of that as focal cortical dysplasia. We can't quite call it that if it's not in the cortex. So in this case, it'd be a relatively deep focal nodular dysplasia that we're talking about. And periventricular nodular heterotopia, which is by far the most common of these conditions I'm referring to, but it's typically an arrest of cells in the ventricles, at the edge of the ventricles. And finally, tuberous sclerosis. Tubers are not usually right in the center of the brain. They're usually distributed out in the periphery, but they can occasionally be in the center of the brain. It would follow this definition of subcortical epilepsy. And traditionally, surgery is reserved for very severe cases, or it's even avoided entirely. We don't have to go back very far to say when we would never operate on a hypothalamic hematoma. Uh, but stereotactic guided laser ablation is emerging, and I would say it's emerging as the standard for uh, some of these type of lesions like hypothalamic hamartoma. But nevertheless, of course, it has to traverse the brain to get to the lesion. So the advantages of focused ultrasound are kind of obvious, especially to this crowd, because it doesn't require craniotomy, doesn't injure the brain as it traverses it, as far as we know, and doesn't necessarily require anesthesia. Uh, it has a focal application of energy. So it's really ideal for treating central brain lesions right in the middle of the brain, although it certainly has some limitations, as we heard about before, that's really important for epilepsy. So on this slide, you can see that the red line outlines the area where you're most likely to be able to treat uh, the brain with focused ultrasound. And that means we have to identify lesions causing epilepsy in this small, confined area. And that's why we're calling it subcortical epilepsy confined to these lesions. And the example case of this is illustrated here from a patient with hypothalamic hamartoma. One of my patients, it's a 31-year-old man with recurrent gelastic seizures. One peculiar thing about hypothalamic hamartoma is the thing that most people identify with is gelastic seizures, which are laughing seizures, seizures with, with uh, mirthless laughter, it said. It's almost like a snicker, but sometimes an outright laugh. So it's very characteristic. Uh, it's typically refractory to multiple medications. In this case, this poor gentleman had tried 15 anti-epileptic drugs already and sometimes causes progressive cognitive decline. Uh, and radio surgery is typically ineffective. There are some reported cases of it being uh, effective, but uh, most people, I think, find it ineffective. Another example of the kind of thing we're talking about is periventricular nodular heterotopia. So you can see there's circles around gray matter arrests in the ventricles. And if you superimpose this picture with the last picture that defined the treatment envelope, you'll see it's right at the edge of the treatment envelope. And that's important because while these are at the edge, they're certainly going to be a common cause of epilepsy. And these people often are otherwise perfectly normal, uh, very functional, uh, typically young women with uh, debilitating seizures. And so to treat them would be a fantastic improvement in their quality of life.
to few studies, an open-label safety and feasibility pilot study in which we intend to enroll up to 15 subjects. They must have one of the subcortical epileptic lesions I mentioned before. The method is generally pretty simple. It's a single MRI-guided FUS treatment session, so not just any one treatment, one treatment session, with a patient that might have conscious sedation for two to four hours uh, if they need it. And of course, we'll create a targeting model in advance and do low temperature treatment to visualize the area to confirm it in the traditional manner, and then a high temperature lesion will be created. The principal inclusion criteria are listed here, and that's one of the most important things I can say today, because if you do have patients with hypothalamic hamartomas, which I'll from now on just call HH, so I don't stumble over that. If you have patients with HH that want to participate in this trial, it'd be fantastic to refer them to us. The important inclusion criteria here, and it's adults age 18 to 80. Now, I mentioned that this often starts in childhood, so right at our top inclusion is going to be a tough one, finding adults with untreated HH, but they are out there. Have at least focal, three focal onset seizures per month, and previously failed two anti-epileptic drugs and currently taking two anti-epileptic drugs. And of course, have intractable epilepsy due to the lesions we mentioned, which have to be located within the treatment window, of course. That means more than about 2.5 centimeters from the inner table of the skull, and also have a volume of less than uh, eight cubic centimeters, which uh, probably won't be a problem for people with this lesion. And this is a timeline of events, which I won't go over in detail, except to say that there'll be a screening or baseline visit to make sure they're meeting inclusion criteria, and then a two-month baseline phase. And in that two-month baseline phase, we'll count seizures to establish the, the baseline and also prepare for the treatment and review the laboratory and other tests that are obtained at the screening visit. The treatment phase then, uh, two months later, so eight weeks later, will then be a uh, treatment with the focused ultrasound and overnight in the hospital and uh, home the next day if all goes well. After that, they'll return for a one-month fault visit, a three-month fault visit, six months, and then at 12 months. Now, the primary outcome measure here is uh, feasibility and safety. So that means to see that we create a lesion that's safe, but the secondary outcome is seizure control, and of course, that's what everyone focuses on, even though it's the secondary outcome. And that means we'll assess seizure frequency throughout this time. And it also means we'd like them to hold their concomitant anti-epileptic drugs constant in the two-month baseline, which for this group of patients probably won't be a problem. And this is just a more detailed view of the schedule of time and events, and it, you probably can't even read it. It's just to mention that it'll follow the same kind of traditional uh, clinical trial you might provide for a new anti-epileptic drug. So that means besides assessing seizure frequency, we'll assess quality of life, we'll assess adverse events, we'll assess neuropsychological testing, and other things. So in conclusion, FUS has high potential to provide effective ablation of subcortical epileptic lesions, which has generated an incredible enthusiasm in the epilepsy community, an overwhelming enthusiasm. And as I mentioned, we just received uh, IRB approval to open enrollment just two weeks ago. And although it has tremendous enthusiasm from the epilepsy community, the HH community, and others, it is relatively uh, uncommon patient that will fulfill these criteria. But I think in the future, as we've mentioned, as we are able to have larger treatment envelopes, then we'll be able to expand the area considerably. And what's really important and why the epilepsy community is so excited might not be obvious. But the real reason is because if we can achieve a risk-benefit ratio so we can treat the lesions without identifying which lesion is actually the cause of the seizures, that would fundamentally change the paradigm of surgical treatment of epilepsy. Because right now, for people with periventricular nodular heterotopia, in order to find the epileptic lesion, you have to pin cushion electrodes into their head, into each one of those uh, nodules, and that's not typically done because that would be so morbid. And even after you find it, then you'd have to treat them all. So at least conceptually, you could imagine that if FUS could get to the point where you wouldn't have to assess, wouldn't have to acquire the morbidity of uh, intracranial monitoring, but instead could empirically treat the lesions, that'd be a fantastic leap forward. So thank you. Thank you.